The Oral History Criminology Project, in conjunction with the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, is pleased to present a conversation with Richard Dick Bennett, yep. that known as Dick to, to all who know him. Yep. Uh, it's March 29th, 2019, and we're filming here in Baltimore, uh, Maryland. Before we get into the sort of nuts and bolts of his ideas and his career, the arc and the pattern of his, his ideas, the give and take of science, I want to give uh, the viewers who aren't familiar with Dick's work, uh, just a brief overview of some of the development of his ideas. Uh, in terms of his education, he earned a BA in 1968 from Randolph-Macon College, Sociology, continuing on to Florida State University, earning a, uh, an MA in 1970 uh, from their famed Criminology and Criminal Justice program before pursuing a doctoral degree from Washington State University in Sociology and Criminal Justice in 1976. While there, he also earned an NIMH fellowship in deviance uh, as well. Over the career, of course of his career, he's held a number of academic positions. He's primarily been at an American University where he's been since 1979, starting as an assistant professor. But his work began in an academic sense as an assistant professor in criminal justice services at East Tennessee State University back in 1970. Held that position for two years before moving on to Youngstown State, where he was an assistant professor and also director of graduate studies in the Department of Criminal Justice. Uh, once again, he was he's then transitioned to American University, held a number of positions, working to full professor uh, in 1987. Uh, the departments had a number of different names, correct? The yeah. Department of Law, uh, Law and Criminology, uh, Administration of Justice, Department of Justice. Uh, yes. Uh, while there, you've held a number of positions as uh, in administrative capacity as well. I'm hoping uh, to get an opportunity to get your take on the balancing of the administrative um, expectations as well as academic expectations. Director of Graduate Studies, you've been chair for uh, a couple of uh, a few stints. You've also served as associate dean for academic affairs, school of public administration. He's also held a number of non-academic positions, I think that are, are also very telling. Uh, I've been a patrolman for Ocean City uh, Police Department in New Jersey, a cottage supervisor for the Beaumont School for Boys Training, uh, the state of Virginia in the mid-1960s. <coughs> He'd been a deputy sheriff, a criminal investigator in Washington County, Tennessee, de de director of research, First Tennessee Region Law Enforcement Planning Agency. You see a nice transition there between uh, getting out of the patrol car and getting uh, into regression analyses and fun stuff like that. Deputy Sheriff Whitman County out in Washington State, 1973 to 75, during his tenure uh, working towards his PhD. Also Associate Research Scientist for a year for the Policy Analysis Division, the Highway Safety Research Institute at the University of Michigan, uh, 77 to 79. Along the way, Nick has earned a number of distinctions from both the uh, Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, where he's been a member since 1972, as well as uh, involvement with the, uh, uh, the American Society of Criminology as well. Uh, in the ACJS, he's chaired the Ethics Committee, uh, producing a, a really important report, uh, the ACJS Code of Ethics, that became effective in the year 2000. I'd imagine there's a, some interesting debates and behind the scenes in, in terms of uh, what kinds of uh, orientations and what kinds of codes uh, or, um, need to be enforced, etc. Chaired the Committee for General Publication, also with a, a signal contribution here, part of it, uh, an effort in 1982 to create Justice Quarterly. He served as president of the or organization uh, in 2002 and 2003. You've also earned the uh, Gerhard O. W. Mueller Award, important for this project, largely uh, due, due to his connection to Frida Adler, uh, for service to the Bureau of Diplomatic uh, Security. International section of the ACGS in 2007. He's been exceptionally active in the international uh, realm. Earned the Founders Award in 2008 and, a, and the Outstanding Mentor Award in 2012 from the organization. The American Society of Criminology, uh, the sister organization of the ACGS, he's held numerous service appointments, especially within uh, the realm of comparative criminology and criminal justice. Division of International Criminology and the Committee of um, uh, Caribbean Criminology. Uh, don't want to overlook his accolades on the teaching front. Uh, earned a number of awards from American University over the course of the years. 
Uh, he's also been noted as his top 25 criminal justice, uh, criminal justice professor by f Forensic ed Education Blog. Had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a number of people on that list, uh, learning all sorts of interesting insights into how to improve my own teaching, uh, as well as the Fulbright, Fulbright Senior Research Scholar Award in 1993 and 94. So, before you begin that long, long journey here uh, through international quarters, as well as uh, the realm of policing and a number of other domains within that larger, uh, under that larger umbrella. Uh, you were just sort of Dick Bennett. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a little bit of uh, a biography of life before you got into an academic enterprise? Brendan, I'd be happy to. Perfect. <clears throat> I was born uh, in 1944 here in Baltimore. Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, my father at that time was the editor, night editor of the Baltimore Sun. He was a newspaper man. And uh, we stayed here uh, for probably about two, three years. Then we moved to New York City. My father took on the position of uh, public relations for the National Association of Manufacturers. So we were in New York City and lived in Scarsdale. And so my very early year years were in Scarsdale. We then moved to Washington, D.C. And my father, and the reason we moved to Washington, D.C. is my father was appointed as Undersecretary of State for Economic Development. And uh, he died. And uh, we decided, or my mother decided, that we needed to go to a place that uh, was a little more kid-friendly, so that's when we moved to Ocean City, New Jersey. Uh, let's see, what happened? Uh, I was in Ocean City, New Jersey, and my mother thought that I was associating with the wrong crowd. Yes, mothers do better than that. And so uh, I went to prep school in Connecticut, uh, Avon Old Farms, and uh, enjoyed it, enjoyed it, enjoyed it, which really, interestingly, had an impact upon my career. Now, you might think, oh, well, it's a prep school. But I decided to go to Rutgers University. I was going into pre-med, and uh, Rutgers had a great uh, bio biology department and pre-med. So, and it was in the state of New Jersey, and again, at that time, we were still residents of the state of New Jersey. So, I was accepted, and I was asked to come down for orientation. So, and now this is not an orientation, you know, most orientations three days before school starts. This was in May. So I go down to Rutgers in May, and we are in the basketball stadium. And I'm sitting there. Now, remember, I came from prep school. The total population of students, 200. And I'm sitting in this stadium with 17,000 students, prospective students for next year. And I said, you know, I don't think I can do this. So immediately I started looking for small schools, and I found one in Ashland, Virginia, called Randolph Mankin College. And again, I went there with the idea of pre-med. I love biology, love chemistry, <clears throat> and I started taking classes, and then I took a class by a guy by the name of Skyler Miller. He had been on the Manhattan Projects in Los Alamos. And uh, it was organic chemistry. And I realized about the first three weeks that I probably was not going to be an organic chemist. I was not going to be pre-med. I had taken a course there because you had to take liberal, it was a liberal arts school, so you had to take liberal arts courses. So I took a course in criminology. And I said, wow, I really like this. So I then changed my major to sociology. And I started taking more juvenile delinquency, deviance, you know, the courses that you normally find in a sociology department. And one summer, I said, hey, you know, what would be fun? I was 21. I said, yeah, let me try being a police officer. Oh. And uh, I called up the chief in Ocean City, New Jersey, summer resort. This is down on the coast, huh? just, just south of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, but much quieter, much different population than Atlantic City. And the chief uh, said, come on down, have an interview. Had an interview. And he said, uh, you know how to use a gun, son? And I says, yes, I've shot. And he says, good. Here's your gun. Show up at 3 o'clock. There's a 4 o'clock roll call. Now, I raised my hand. I was sworn in. And I became a police officer. Uh, thank God that I never had to use my weapon. Because when you're 21 with no training, you know, you can be quite dangerous with a firearm. So I finished that. Went back to school, took more courses at randolph Macon, and decided, you know, Corrections might be something I'd like to try. So the next summer, I got a job at Beaumont School for Boys, which is a reformatory in Goochland, uh, which is just west of, on the James River, 
just west of, uh, of Richmond and kind of enjoyed that and went back and did this and did that and <clears throat> finished up, graduated, and I went, what am I going to do now? So I said, well, you know, I'm not really interested in corrections. That's not really my thing. I had, I had a good experience, but it wasn't something I wanted to make a life career. So I kind of hung around a year and did some retail and just trying to think what I wanted to do. <clears throat> and I had a friend who had gone to Florida State. And he said, there's a great program down here. Come down. And I figured, well, not doing anything. Let's go to Florida State. So I went down to Florida State. And this is where things really become interesting. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I started thinking more and more about law enforcement. So OK, I'm going to get a master's degree. I'm going to apply to the FBI. I'm going to apply to the DEA. You know, I'm going to apply to federal law enforcement. Had a really met a guy, really good friend. And uh, we were roommates for a while. And uh, he wanted to be an academic. So he heard of this job at East Tennessee State University. So he got on the plane, and it was for criminal justice, got on the plane, flew up. And he called me, and he said, Dick, get on the next plane. And I said, Phil, why? And he said, well, in the interview, not only was the chair of the criminal justice department there, a new department, but the Department of Sociology chair was there. And they kind of fought, the two chairs, and sociology offered me a position. He said, so. They're looking for someone for criminal justice. So that you just had your master's at that point, correct? Just finishing up my master's. Okay. I hadn't finished it. Okay. Just finishing it. I was going to finish at the end of that term. All right. All right. So I got to ask: Was there something that drew you to Florida State, other than the? Other did the you, did you know the repute and the? <clears throat> I did know the repute, yeah. and my friend said this is a great program. Okay. You know, we've got some really interesting people down here. They're yeah. doing interesting work. You know, and for me, research was kind of, yeah, sure, why? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's play with well, it. Why not do the PhD there? Were you just more interested in being out oh, field? Oh, okay, no. Yeah, I'd done the master's. Right. I wasn't even thinking about a PhD. Okay. I just wanted a master's because I wanted to go into law enforcement. All right. And the master would get me there. All right. Okay. So here I am, finishing up my master's. My friend Phil yeah. took this job interview at East Tennessee State University. He called me and said, Dick, get on a plane. They're looking for you, and I talked you up. And the chair is really interested in interviewing you. So I get on a plane, go up, I have my interview, and the chair says, I'm going to offer you a job. Right then and there. These were the old days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Back then, a master's degree got you into university teaching at the undergraduate level. Now, I suspect that this is the early days of criminology when it was just coming out of the admin. Well, not the, just the LEAA. Not criminology. Right. Criminal justice. Criminal justice just in its infancy at in, this point, right? In its so infancy, yeah. We, we need people who have some measure of expertise to come in and, right, and right, convey right. what they know. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay? Yeah. So I got the job. Yeah. Okay. And while I was there. And uh, you, have you ever been to Tennessee at this point? No! <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, it was a sojourn into a foreign land. Yeah. Uh, I, a couple of things I did. I worked for the First Tennessee Region Law Enforcement uh, Agency. Back in the day, this is when LEAA was just getting going, mm -hmm. they had state agencies who would basically present to LEAA what the state needed oh. in order to upgrade right. mm -hmm. law enforcement and criminal justice. But basically, in those days, it was law enforcement. It wasn't really criminal justice. So <clears throat> I started working, you know, not part time, this was gratis for this agency. And one of the first things they wanted me to do was do a jail survey. So I looked at the various counties, looked at their jails, et cetera. And uh, one of the really interesting experiences that I had was in a county just south of the county in which East Tennessee State University was, Unicoi County. So I go down to Unicoi County, I see Unicoi County Jail. Oh my God. The jail was built with bars and cell blocks from the Civil War, huh. OK? So you can get an idea. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so we did this. And what we had to do is, is look for other counties. So I did five counties in that region, First Tennessee region, uh, because the federal government wasn't going to fund one small jail. They were going to fund a regional jail. Well, we got the regional jail for them. But that was an interesting experience. But let me tell you about Unicoi. Now, this is in the 70s. Got down to Unicoi, and uh, I wanted to go to the bathroom. Right? This is the courthouse. I want to go to the bathroom. So I walk up and there's male, female, and colored. 1970. 1970s. Yeah, they didn't get the bathroom. And the water fountain was whites, colored. Yeah. 
You know, and I'm good. that's why I call it a sojourn into a foreign land. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was raised in a very liberal family, yeah. you know, things like that. And I just said, wow, can I believe this? Wow. So, yes. So we got the report in, got the, got the regional jail. The only way that we sold the regional jail to the state, mm -hmm. the region, federal government was willing to do it, was that we put in, ready for this, a rec room. No, 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 not for the prisoners. Oh. No, no. For the staff. For the deputy sheriffs. Uh. Because remember, it's regional. Uh. You had to drive your people there. And by having, you know, a place where they could relax, play pool, that sold it. <laughs> Once again, the foreign land and the completely... Sojourn into experience. a foreign land. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And meanwhile, you're teaching at the same time. I'm teaching. Oh, the whole, okay. I mean, I'm full-time okay. teaching. Okay, so this, this is like a three, four, a four, four load kind of thing. Oh, yeah, of course. Full-time. The old days in. when four, yeah. four. Yep. You know, we have faculty coming in now. What do you mean? A two, two? Yeah. Why can't I have a one, one? You know, and, and how much money are you going to give me to sign? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's changed. It has changed. Okay. So I'm there, and I'm starting to look at the various ACJS and the various uh, news uh, what do you call them? Uh, not footnotes, but you know, kind of like footnotes in sociology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the professional, professional circulars. Yeah, right. kind of. And I started noticing that now the new jobs were because I remember this was a sojourn. Mm -hmm. I didn't plan on spending my life in East Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that they started changing from MA required to PhD preferred, and then PhD required. So this friend of mine, Phil, you know, we're yeah. still friends, <laughs> decided we're going to apply for a PhD program. Huh. So we applied to a bunch of them, et cetera, and I was accepted at Washington State. And Phil was not, uh -huh. which he really was upset about. Yeah. Uh, and so he decided he was not going to go to graduate school, yeah. but I had already accepted at Washington State. I said, I've never been to the West Coast. Hey, this is going to be an experience. So uh, again, what, what, why Washington State? Washington State because it was a sociology program. Now remember, we didn't have criminal justice programs, no. except the one in Albany had just started. Oh. And I was uh. talking to people, they said, don't go to a new program. And they said a new program has to you know, work its way out, which Albany of course did. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you're gonna be there for a long time, you know, this, that, and the other. So, went to Washington State. And I went there because Jim Short was there, uh, who had done work, as you know, in Chicago with juvenile delinquency, mm -hmm. and uh, great reputation. So I, uh, <laughs> You're going to love this. Yeah. So, of course, being, I was a criminal investigator now, by the way, in Tennessee at the time. The sheriff came to me and the sheriff said, uh, you know, your, your new faculty said, you got any expertise in putting together a, a reporting system? Mm -hmm. He said, the, you know, the states require me now to send down my statistics, arrest statistics, so they can go to uh, the FBI. Can you believe that? And I said, well, sir, you know, if, if that's the regulation, that's the regulation. So he said, would you set up a system for me? And I said, well, of course. Wow. So I was setting up a system for him, and he said, do you have any other skills? And I said, well, I you know, was a street cop for a while, for a summer, and he said, can you do any criminal investigation? Yeah. And I said, well, I'll try. And so I became a criminal investigator <laughs> and worked there for two years with the sheriff. Yeah. Got his record system going, and then started doing criminal investigation. Uh, a lot of arson work. Well, in Tennessee, if you have an enemy, they burn you out. No. So, you know, what you want to do is you want to find out, go and interview and say, you, you haven't feuds with anybody, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then you start saying, okay, these people, oh, this family. Well, let's go talk to these, let's interview these families. Interview, right? Not interrogation, interview. So we did a series of interviews and then, of course, Miranda and all this stuff came in. And so if it looked like it was going to go from an interview to an interrogation, of course, you know, you read the person the rights and, and then you started there. So, okay. I do a little research, see? And my research is uh, to look what the town of Pullman, Washington is like. So, of course, where do you go? Chamber of Commerce. Oh. Chamber of Commerce sends me this brochure of God's country. Forest, bubbling brooks, beautiful mountains. And I go, yes, I'm there. So I load my Volvo in the back of a U-Haul with all my belongings and I head across country. Night is falling. I gotta make this dramatic. <laughs> Night is falling, and I'm going now through Idaho. And as the sun sets, I'm going up on the interstate, beautiful trees, 
and a bubbling brook, and I say, I'm in heaven. Because uh, I love the outdoors. Yeah. Do a lot of camping and hiking. The night falls. And I'm driving, and you know, you see things. You see, I look like mountains, you know, trees, all the stuff. I say, I'm happy. So I pull into this motel to spend the night. I wake up the next morning and walk out. There are no trees, there are no mountains, wheat fields. Miles and miles of wheat fields. So, first disappointment. But once I started taking classes, I loved it. I went into the chair's office the first day that I was there. This is before school started. And he said, ah, oh, Dick, how are you doing? Sit down, let's talk. And said, he gave me a, a card, and on it was a list of courses. And I said, Mel, you know, I, I, I appreciate that, but those aren't the courses I'm really interested in. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Those aren't the courses you're taking. Those are the courses you're teaching. <laughs> da -da. So, there I was. We had one faculty member, Jim Short, who loved undergraduates. He was the only faculty member who taught undergraduate classes. All the rest were taught by us, the, gra the PhD graduate students. So, <clears throat> there you have it. Yeah. So, wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what was he... Uh, then I met at a uh, ACGS meeting, of course, yeah. you said in 1972, I joined ACGS. I met a person, Dick Myron. Mm. Dick Myron had uh, started the program at Albany, yeah. okay? He was, he was the one that started the program. And uh, he got really tired of it. He hired these great people, and he said, you know something? He said, I don't want to be a dean of prim prima donnas. He said, so I'm going to resign, and I'm going to move south. And he loved this, because he said, you know, Dick, he said, when I took this job, I didn't move far, far enough south. He said, you still have winners here. So, yeah. so I was hired. I was hired at the same time that Jim Short, uh, not Jim Short, excuse me, uh, Jim Fife was hired. Okay. And uh, Jim and I became lifelong friends right. and colleagues. And uh, we did some research together. And uh, you know, I did uh, some consulting with him and stuff like that. And just uh, loved the AU. So I, I suppose that, the, how did the development of the ideas and the research behind policing work in an environment like Washington State that may have been missing an expert uh, in Okay, I, I forgot to say. Yeah. At Florida State, you had to do S, uh, theses. Yeah. So my thesis was on uh, an empirical investigation of the symbolic assailant. I don't know if you're familiar with right. that. That's uh, it's the one uh, Skolnick, Skolnick talked about. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So what I did is I created an experiment. I had a series of slides yeah. of various people by age, race, and gender doing in certain actions, mm -hmm. and Miami Police Department was more than happy to let me use their officers, their patrol officers, for this uh, research. And uh, that, uh, there it was, I wrote it up, and that was yeah. my thesis. Okay. Yeah, and then which was the first publication. And then you wanted to continue that at, at Washington State to well, develop that further? Or the reason that I wanted to do that is because I found that research was exactly like criminal investigation. Uh -huh. There's a whole bunch of disparate parts out there. And if you're going to get a conviction, you've got to put them all together to empirically explain why a crime was committed and why this person committed that crime. Yeah. And the same thing with research. Yeah. You don't know the outcome. You know the disparate elements based on theory. You put it together, you create a model, and you yeah. operationalize that model and you put it in the field. Okay. And I said, oh boy, yeah. I love doing this. <laughs> now, that's easy. The, 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 bio, the biographical connection seems to be readily apparent with that. Now, yeah. where did the international angle come from? Ah, oh, wow. So you mentioned Mel, I presume that's Mel, Mel de Fleur. Fleur. Mel de Fleur, yes. And so you, you uh, in a footnote in your presidential reference, uh, presumably his wife? Yes, Lois, Lois de Fleur. As, as Lois de Fleur had done some international stuff. Yeah. And it was, to me it was fascinating. Huh. You know, I had been in Tennessee, which was a totally different, it was an alien culture. Right. Remember, I came from the north, went to prep yeah. school in the north, you know, yeah. and it was just alien culture. And in trying to understand how culture affects behavior, how it affects policing. It just became something that I was very interested in. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. So that's how I started moving that way. Yeah. Uh, I then shifted from looking at just police to uh, international crime. And I built a data set called Corlett's Crime. 
and did a series of publications out of that. Uh, and really enjoyed that. What, was this the foundation for your doctoral research? Or was this later than your, your the correlates? Uh, what, okay, what I did for my dissertation was to go back to Tennessee. Huh. It was to look about recruit socialization. How do you create a police officer? So I got three police departments. Again, I had been working for the region, remember? And I was in contact with police departments, Memphis, Nashville, uh, Knoxville. And so I talked to the commissioners and I said, look, I'm interested in doing this study. Would you be interested in the findings? Of course they said yes. So that was my dissertation. Huh. And it was supported by good old Jim Short. He said, how much money do you need? And I said, Jim, I love you. <laughs> and so that, that's how I did it. And the study was looking at before people went to the academy, because I had the names of the people, and I surveyed them. And then I surveyed them at the end of the academy training. And then I surveyed them six months into the, in the field. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Yeah. To become a sworn law enforcement officer in Tennessee, deputy sheriff, I had to go to police training. So the state... Again? Oh, yeah. you are, you are, no, no. no, no, no. Remember, <laughs> when, I was, when, when I was in Ocean City, <laughs> they um, gave me the gun um, and the badge and said, well, wow. police. So to be a certified officer, so I went to Donaldson. Now, the state of Tennessee, the big cities, had their own training. But the rural ones all used what was known as Donaldson. Uh, it's in, right outside of Nashville. And I went there for 200 hours of training. So I'm at Donaldson, and uh, wonderful things. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you one experience. Oh. We're on the, on the firing line. Now, I've, I've shot. I used to hunt as a kid and stuff like that, so I've shot a lot. And uh, we're doing the police shooting, you know, and uh, I'm firing away at my target. And I'm just looking at the other guy's target next to me, and, you know, it, there's no holes. And the instructor walks up to him. So I slip my earmuff off a little bit because I want to hear it. And the instructor says, son, he says, if y'all won't hit that target, you got to open your eyes. <laughs> so there's the, there's the type yeah. of uh, training. And that, that person had been a police officer for two years. Hmm. Because in the state, you don't have to be certified in order to be a police officer. But within two years, you have to be trained. Th this is all interesting because it's, it's indicative of the development of the professionalization. Oh, my right? God. So yeah. oh, yes. there are oh, standards yes. yeah, that are yeah. going to be expected, and that's permutating. Per yeah. uh, the, the permutation from the major cities yeah. and the metropolitan yeah. areas out to the... Out to and the, the only reason the it was that many hours is because the federal government said, you want federal funds? Yeah. You have to have training this many hours. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, wonderful things. Yeah. Like they put us in a room uh, about a quarter the size of this, yeah. threw in a tear gas canister and closed the door. Huh. <laughs> so, some of your early work has a different kind of tinge to it as well in that you're using a lot of macro, macro data sets to do okay, this, now like that, international comparison. That was international. I started, right. I became very interested in international crime. Yeah. And uh, then I built this correlates of crime data set, which looked at Interpol data. Uh, and I went to the World Bank. I went to the, uh, uh, let's see, the World Labor Organization to collect all their data on these countries. All right. There were 60 countries in the data set. And we did it over a 20 year period of time. Yeah collected those data. Uh, they're available, by the way, and about, oh, about 15 dissertations have been done in huh. the past on that. ICPSR has the data set, Correlates of Crime. This, uh, and it's contemporary data, as you put that on a thumb drive. Oh, of course. Like, yeah, like you, just you, you just download You, uh, I suspect, were... What do you mean, thumb drive? <laughs> it's called a mainframe computer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Remember arduous, the cards? That's arduous work. Remember all the cards? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, let me see. Yeah, where am I? So, so we're talking okay, about the so, macro data. So, so I did that. It reminds me a lot of Gary LaFree's work. In, yeah, in yeah, yeah, sense. yeah. You're testing these really interesting hypotheses and these theories. Yeah. But you're using these massive data sets. Right, right. Okay. So, so. You're, you're moving from like the micro in yeah. terms of the socialization and attributes of adopting particular norms and subcultural elements, yeah. and then you're scaling this up to the, but the remember, macro. It's a rather fascinating. It's still criminal investigation. That's okay. You got all these. Desperate parts, and you're putting them together. Right. So, I wrote manuscripts, sent them off to publishers. Guess what the reviewer said? Interpol data. Oh. Interpol data is trash. So, Jim Lynch and I. This is the difference without. Does a difference make a difference? Bingo. Great title. So, yeah. Jim Lynch and I said, okay, yeah. let's 
do an article comparing data sets using different methodologies. Okay? And we called it, Does a Difference Make a Difference? And criminology picked it up. Huh. Bingo! Guess what? <laughs> All these manuscripts that I had in the past were now being published. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah. What was the, the pushback was just that there was more garbage, they hadn't been validated. Yeah, right, exactly. And so it's built exactly. on a... Yeah, uh, you know, it's just it's garbage. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was a fun time working with Jim. Yeah. And Jim and I had worked together for oh, years. Sure. We were actually, at, when he was at AU, mm -hmm. we were roommates, <laughs> office mates. Yeah, we go way back. So, uh, looking through the, the, the various pub publications that you've had over the course of your career, they, they develop, uh, they, there's all sorts of interesting facets of policing that are, that are uh, disclosed and investigated here. There's issues of job satisfaction, occupational socialization. There's issues of fear of crime. You've also delved into some of those yep. kinds of issues. These cross-national comparisons. There's a lot of theory testing, mm -hmm. uh, sort of traditional theories, as well as you, uh, one of your more uh, cited papers is a, a test of rational, uh, excuse me, of uh, of routine activities. Yeah. Uh, you've also uh, put on the agenda the need to develop a theory with yes, regard correct. to Caribbean, yes, um, yes, yes, uh, Caribbean yeah. countries. Um, so now, you ask me how I got to the Caribbean. No, I, well, <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get to that, I, I, I want to know if you see these as part of a whole. Is this Are these pieces that are all pieced into a mosaic that you see as being sort of a consistent whole? Or are these sort of micro agendas that you just took an opportunity and maybe there was something intriguing about this and then you move on to the next thing that Brendan, you did. of course. <laughs> All right. Of course, I was developing Let's look a behind grand it. trace. All right. Hey, do you believe that? I, I don't know. Some, some, I wouldn't. No. I said it with a straight face. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, my life has been interest. Yeah. I go from one thing to another because all of a sudden I see something happening huh. and I go, wow, what explains that? Okay. So if you want to say, oh, you know, look at this trajectory. Yeah. He was on the path and never strayed. Right. No, my path was not a path. It was just a whole bunch of turns. Okay. And because even today, like the research I'm doing now, yeah. you know, it's just something that, it's interesting. Okay. It gets me enthusiastic. The trick is to make it interesting to others, though, too, right? You got it. Yeah, in you terms of the, the yeah. salesmanship involved with yeah. making it relevant and, and yeah, the challenges yeah, yeah. there. You talked a little bit about some of the difficulties with selling international comparative kinds of dynamics oh, yeah, in your presidential yeah. address. Yeah. And there's some, there's some real definitive barriers that you're outlining. Well, things they, like they, language. And things language. Like getting, access. Get access to data. Exactly. Right? It could be embarrassing, the fact exactly. that you have these, exactly. these crime spikes, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So uh, has there been any shift or any movement over the course of your career here? Well, Are you noticing that you're it, having more success and then you keep amplifying that? And you amplify resistant? it, but it's all networking. Okay. So... I, I noticed that it, it, you thank numerous people over the course of the Oh, yeah. And the manuscripts, are. it seems like it's a, a roster that rotates depending on the, the research yes, question. Yes, yes, it yeah. does. Okay. Had a colleague at AU. He gets a Fulbright hmm. down to Belize, Central America. Yeah. Where in the hell's Belize? <laughs> you know, I didn't know where Belize was. Okay, it's Central America, but where? Uh -huh. And he gives me a call and he says, Dick, he says, Is this Phil again? No, <laughs> no, it's not Phil. <laughs> And uh, he says, uh, come on down. He said, I think there's a great research opportunity here. Let's see if we can't sell a fear of crime survey. Hmm. So, go down, of course, meet with the prime minister. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, oh, listen, there's one restaurant, good restaurant in Belize City. And of course, the prime minister likes to eat there. You're literally getting the royal treatment. So we go there, yeah. yeah, yeah. But So we get in, interview with the prime minister. And uh, he says, great idea, mm. you know, uh, we'll talk to the police and we'll get everything set so that you know that you're here, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So when we first came down, you're going to love this, <clears throat> when we first came down to Belize, I'm, of course, dressed in suit, right? And uh, I want to touch base with everyone so that they know what we're doing in the street, because we're going to be sending interviewers out to interview citizens about fear of crime, police services, et cetera. So I want everybody to know that this is not a hatchet job. You know, we're not going to be critical. We're just going to talk about fear of crime. 
Or do you, did you get a sense that there were suspicions? Because this is a different cultural dynamic, right? Oh my right? God, yeah. Oh yeah. The, the, the system, the systematic corruption that you had to sort of ally their fears on that, well, police, or other kinds. Well, police of... had very little corruption. Okay. It was a, it, it was a pretty good. It was run by the Brits. Okay. You know, when when you have a colony run by the Brits, you don't have as much corruption uh, as you do by the Spanish. Uh, I mean, excuse me. I don't want to cast aspersions <laughs> on any country. Uh, but you you have less corruption. Mm -hmm. So one of the places I love this. One of the places I had to go was the commander of the defense forces. Yeah, because again, he has his fingers in everything in Belize. Mm. So I wanted to make sure that he was well aware of what we're doing. Mm. So I bring down a one-page synopsis. I deliver the synopsis to him. We talk and talk. But when I walk in, he's sitting at his desk. He has a chair and a table like this about, well, where the camera's located, about mm -hmm. that far away. Mm -hmm. And he sits down, and I give him the thing, and he says, excuse me and he met motions to his attendant mm -hmm. to give me a slip of paper. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate this. And I'm looking, and guess what it is? It's a request list for military equipment. Mm -hmm. And I said, sir, I think you're confusing me with someone else. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. I am down here as a social scientist from the American University, mm -hmm. and we're conducting a study on fear of crime. Oh, I understand. Yeah, oh, cool, sure. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying, but make sure you take that list back to Washington. <laughs> Don't you love it? Yeah, it's great. Okay, so I'll tell you a few other things. Yeah. Do you want me to tell you these stories? No, I, these are great because it, it, it's all about that cultural immersion. Oh, right? okay. And so you're wrapping your mind around this and you've got to understand the way of you the land. You're on the ground. You right? do. You're, you're on the ground. You do. Okay, right? now, time to sample. Yeah. Okay? So now how do we do it in the United States? We do it by housing units. Hmm. Great! Yeah. So I go to the you know, the Division yeah. of Health and Human Services Housing, and I asked for the records. Of course, they know that, you know, we're here. The Prime Minister said, research team, American University's here, give them anything they want. So they pull out this dusty, dusty ledger. You know, one of these things about this big. And I look at it, and the last entry is 1963. Yeah. And I'm going, this is the 90s. I said, I don't think this is going to work. You know, tax records. This isn't going to work. So we think, oh boy, what else? Well, water uh -huh. and sewer. Uh -huh. So we're walking now to the, you know, water department. And we're in the morning. And I see all these women coming out with buckets, dumping them in the little canals. And there's feces in it. So I'm going, okay, I don't think we have a sewer system here. And we could walking further, and all the women with buckets are at the city well getting water. Mm. And I'm going, okay, that's not going to work. Back so to so we, didn't, we didn't even go to the place. Mm. We turned around and came back. At nighttime, you'd walk around, and you know, they don't have screens, they don't have shutters, and all these eerie lights would be coming from every one of the shacks. Televisions. And it was interesting because we were down there during the winter, and all the stations that were on were Chicago, and they were talking about snow and stuff like that. Wait a minute, Chicago? Well, the satellite company that feeds everybody down there was stealing satellite. Oh. And of course, what's geosynchronous with Belize? What's that? Chicago. Oh, wow. Huh. So we said, everybody has electricity! Bingo! Huh. So we go to the electric company, and we know what the resident population is, approximately. Mm -hmm and only about 10% have electrical hookups. So we said, okay, this is going to be a problem. So we started out on the street, and we would come to a pole, and there'd be a meter, but before the meter, we'd see about 15, 10, 15 tap-ins. Tap so what we'd do is we'd follow the tap-in, mm -hmm. and they'd go to about 15 houses. Mm -hmm. So our sampling was, find the meter box, uh -huh. and then you had, each interviewer had a random number to pick, uh -huh. and they'd count, they'd count the number, and if, let's say there were 10, uh -huh. then they'd look at the scale and say, oh, for, for 10, you pick number two. This is the good stuff, because this never appears in print, right? I know! So, like, it's, it's a, it may be a footnote. It, it was, like that, in right? the publications. Yeah. So that's how we did our sampling. Yeah. <laughs> the Amazing, huh? The creativity involved with some of these oh, kind wow. of things. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, that was that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe switching tracks here a little, little bit here. Well, uh, wait a second. Yeah. Let me give continuity here. Sure. 
Now I'm in Belize. All right. I'm going, whoa, mm -hmm. this is really fascinating. Again, another culture, mm -hmm. the way people do things, the poverty, the way they adapt to poverty. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to do something in the Caribbean. All right. So I talked to an ambassador friend of mine, and he says, well, get a Fulbright. Huh. He said, but make sure there's a research, senior research Fulbright and not an educational Fulbright, because an educational Fulbright is going to put you in one country. Mm. at one university. Uh -huh. Ah, see? So, I applied for it and I wanted to do the whole Caribbean. Yeah. Well, Fulbright comes back and says, excuse me, under the rules of Fulbright, it has to be a country for which you are fluent in the language. Yeah. Okay, so now all of a sudden, I'm only looking at English-speaking Caribbean. Mm. I argue with Fulbright, and I say, because I know about each one of these countries, I argue with Fulbright. Mm -hmm. Look, okay, it's French in, in Martinique, mm -hmm. but English is known to everyone and all the police officers. Why? Because it's a tourist attraction. Uh, yeah. Okay? Uh. Fulbright said, no. Huh. Okay, so how did I get access? I got the Fulbright. Yeah. How did I get access? The godfather of my son uh. happens to be, or was at that time, the number two in State Department dignitary, dignitary protection. Huh. So, RSOs, regional security officers, every country either has a RSO, mm -hmm. like in Jamaica RSO, mm -hmm. Barbados RSO, Trinidad and Tobago RSO, mm -hmm. but the smaller countries, the RSO in the big country is the regional security officer for that area. Uh -huh. Now, regional security officers basically do th two things. They protect the embassy, they protect embassy employees, and they also deal with individuals, tourists, except that have problems in that jurisdiction. In order to protect American employees of the embassy, because in the Caribbean, they live in the economy. It's not like if you go to Islamabad. They live in a compound yeah. on embassy property because of threat. But in the Caribbean, there was no threat. So they would live in the community. Well, what if someone's robbed? What if someone's house is robbed? You have to have perfect liaison with the local police. Because remember, you don't have the right to carry a firearm and make arrests in Trinidad and Tobago. So you have dramatic relationships with the commissioners of police and all the top rankings. So Denny, the RSO, introduced me to all the RSOs and each nation I came to, I did Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago. The first stop was to the RSO's office, introduce myself, and he would introduce me to the Commissioner of Police. Huh. So, and the Commissioner of Police, of course, RSO's, embassies have a lot of money to give. Governments are more than happy to help the RSO. This academic from Washington, D.C. appeared to present no problems. Sure, do it. <laughs> I got to tell you the first story. Yeah. So here I am in uh, Jamaica, my first stop. And the RSO is talking to me. He says, look, I'm going to introduce you to the chief. I've asked the chief to come over. He'll be in in a few minutes. We're going to talk about it. You're going to talk about what you're going to do. He said he's, going to, he's already given you permission, but he just wants a, a briefing as to what you're going to do. Fine. Okay. He says, and by the way, before you leave, uh, I, I want you to wear this. And he gives me a bulletproof vest. And I'm sitting there and going in my mind, Okay, I'm down here, I'm going to survey officers, I'm going to spend about 250 to 300 hours with officers in the street, and I'm wearing a bulletproof vest, and no one else is? Is that going to create a barrier that I won't be able to overcome? And I said, no thanks. And he said, I'm, I'm warning you. He said, okay, you know, you get your choice, but if you get hurt, don't come back on yeah, me. Yeah. I said, fine. So you, in your presidential, you referenced that even if you can do a, overcome some of these hurdles and these barriers that you encounter in terms of just getting entree into some of these environments and gathering the data, and the data are, are worth working with, there's still the impediment of, of journals to publish in, right? And so... No, because when I got back, journals were interested in okay. that type of research because okay. more and more academics and journals were saying, 
comparative is interesting. Okay. Now, again, it wasn't easy, but it was done. Okay. So the, there's been some development on that. There's been a lot of development yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah. Speaking yeah. of developments, you were at the founding, the founding of, of, of JQ. Can you yes. maybe give us some behind the scenes here in terms of the the ideas to sustain that, the need for this this particular journal, the vision for it? <laughs> yeah. uh, Do you want to know what the vision was? Sure. Okay. Kent Jocelyn was the editor of the Journal of Criminal Justice at that time. Yeah. And I'm blanking on who was the president. I think it was Bob Culbertson, but I'm not sure. Okay. So we're at a meeting, and the executive board wants a little more editorial control. And Kent Johnson was there, and what Kent Johnson, I, this is a paraphrase, I can't sure. remember the quote. Sure. But he said, when you become a real organization, I'll give you editorial control. Oh. Now, that's a paraphrase. Oh, yeah. Okay? And the executive board, and especially the president, blew up! Yeah. So Culberson took, I think it was Culberson, took me aside and he says, you start a journal. <laughs> so Jack Green was very much involved in it, oh. uh, and a bunch of other people were very much involved. Oh. And we sat down and we started thinking about what, how, we, how do you start a journal? Yeah. And uh, I at AU started looking around, and lo and behold, uh, we had law school in the law journal. So I call up the dean, I say, it's a beautiful looking journal. Who publishes it? And he said, well, we have a printer out in Omaha, Nebraska, Christensen Brothers. So I call Mr. Christensen, and he said, be happy to do it for you. You know, and she started working out deals. And then, okay, what's the journal gonna look like? Well, this is nepotism, but she didn't charge us anything. Uh, my aunt, is a graphic designer in New York City. <laughs> Was. So I said, would you do a cover? And she said, of course I will. She says, well, what do you want to look like? And I said, I'm not a graphic designer. You do it. <laughs> and you saw Justice Quarter with JQ yeah. and Clean. Yep. There we went. Yeah. We started soliciting articles. And that, that was housed at AU originally, correct? It was. Rita Simon was the editor. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's interesting. Rita Simon was the edit. Why we chose her? She was the editor of the ASA, yeah. American Sociological Review. Huh. So I mean, she had been in a, an editor of a really powerful journal. All right. She was with us yep. at AU, so we turned to her. Perfect. And uh, she said, "Great." And by the way, made a lot of enemies doing that. All right. Because there were a lot of people in the academy mm -hmm. who wanted to be the editor, uh -huh. and you know, who had no editorial experience. Huh. So we convinced the editorial board. Our committee did. Yeah. Is it look? We can go with someone from ACJS with no editorial experience, no name, rep no name recognition in the field. Or we can go with Rita Simon, who knows everybody in the field, at least in sociology and now criminal justice, and has edited a top tier journal. Yeah. And the board, reluctantly, but they did, yeah. they went with uh, Rita Simon. Uh, no, you, so also within the ACJS, you've, you've been instrumental in the uh, developing that conversation about the code of ethics. So <laughs> the, the, the reason, the rationale, the, the, the impetus for it, the, the ultimate, the statement that ultimately emerged, uh, has it been accepted, uh, widely embraced? It has and, now, it's condition yeah. of membership. Okay. That's why it had to go before an amendment to, to our constitution. Yeah. That's why it took so long. Okay. Because of the process, you have to give everybody a year's event notice, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had had experience, not my personal experience, mm -hmm. but experience with my graduate students of being sexually harassed, right. inappropriately treated, mm -hmm. uh, were working on projects, never got co-editorship, uh, okay. you know, a whole variety of things. All right. And uh, I said, and a couple others got together and said, so, you know, we've got to do something. All right. You know, we have to have ethical standards. So I, uh, committee got together, we started developing it, and I called my friend who was then the uh, head of ethics committee. Who, who's some of the names that are involved uh, in this conversation? I forget right now. Uh, forget four, right four or five folks yeah. come together. And... But the person who ran ethics yeah. at AS, ASA, mm -hmm. American Sociological Association, and I said, you know, can we use yours as a model? Mm. He said, well, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, take it, do it. So if you'll notice in the bottom mm -hmm. under the yeah, Code of Ethics, yeah. it says thank you for, huh. you know, permission was granted. Yeah. Now, we modified it to sure. fit our thing. Yeah. Okay. The executive board said, no, we don't want one. Think of all the work it's going to be. Hmm. 
So again, I got back with my friend. Because it's more administration that they have to, oh, they have to know, monitor and they have, have to accept, monitor, we accept have to, complaints we have and to vet them. Yeah, and, we have to vet them. We have yeah. to have hearings. You know, right. ah, don't want to do it. All right. Uh, later, I found out, and no, I'm not even mention. Sure. Uh, later on, I found out that one of the people who really objected to it had uh, had a relationship with his student. Oh, no. There's a conflict. There's a little conflict there. There okay. we go. So, we... I again called my friend at ASA, yeah. and he said, Dick, he says, it's really rare. He said, last year I had one, com one complaint we had to deal with. Huh. He said, it's very rare. Oh. Very rare in the field. Hmm. So, now that was back then. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. So, brought that to the executive board, presented it with them, argued for it, my committee argued for it, and the executive board said, okay, huh. we okay it. Now, yeah. but because one of the conditions you have in it is that you can be terminated for your membership, Mm -hmm. That's the highest sanction. Mm -hmm. It has to go for a constitutional amendment to the Constitution. Uh, that took a year and then a year. So uh -huh. it took a long time from when we first presented yeah. until it actually came into existence. Okay. I was also the chair under Jim Short of the ASC Ethics Committee. Uh, okay. And we went through the same hassle okay. with the executive board, but the executive board said no. Uh, and it wasn't too much later. They actually got the, uh, what they had done in the interim. Yeah. So they said, if you're interested in ethics, see the ethics huh. code of ACJS. Uh, and now, of course, as you know, ASC has its own. Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about the development of your administrative career and, and how, <laughs> how that administrative career has uh, also tracked the development of your intellectual career here, right? There's, there's always this sort of tension between the scholarship and the trade-offs involved. Yeah. Some find it advantageous, others find it to be a, a burdensome uh, Okay, I, I guess experience I'm, I'm old school. Yeah. And that is, once I got to AU with Dick Myron, mm -hmm. and we had uh, Neil Kerwin was our uh, dean, and both of them were very research-oriented, mm -hmm. and they said, look, you know, uh, tell us what you want to do, and tell us what's going to cost. We'll be happy to help you. Yeah. So it was a really a research environment. My colleagues were great. Yeah. So when it came time that we needed a chair, that was my home. Yeah. You know, I spent a lot of time there, a lot of time with these people. It was my home. Okay. So what are you going to do? So you see this as a, a duty. It was a duty, an obligation. All right. So the first time that I took it, it was an obligation. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed working with my colleagues. Uh, my philosophy was don't use the stick. Use the carrot, right. because stick in academe doesn't work. Now I know a lot of a lot of chairs say, "Oh, I'm going to punish you. You know, you're going to teach these classes. You're going to teach them at horrible times." Yeah. You know, I no, because if you do that, remember this is my home. Right. If you do that, what is that faculty member going to do? I'm sure. They're going to teach crappy classes. Yeah. They're going to get out of everything. They're going to resent you. Mm -hmm. They're going to be non-productive members yeah. in your family. There's a different skill set that's required there, though, in the development of that. It's sort of a political role in some capacity, right, in the sense that you've got to deal with upper-level administrators yeah. and you've got to deal but with... But remember, I yeah. had really good people above me. Yeah. The dean was very supportive. Yeah. So, and he was reasonable. Okay. So what I would do is if... You know, you can't give everybody everything all the time. Oh, sure. So what I became is kind of a deal-maker. All right. I'd say... Brendan, look, yeah. if you'll do teach this class and do this, next semester you get this. All right. Yeah. Or the same semester you get this. Yeah. So I and my dean was very supportive. I said, look, this guy needs a little seed money for, yeah. for, for research. He is going to do this for us. Yeah. Can I give him seed money? Okay. Because I didn't have a budget. Okay. Back in the early days of AU, the dean the chairs did not have a budget. Huh. So it all had to come through the dean's office. So I say, you know, look, this person wants to go to ASC and ACJS. It's going to be way over what our policy is in terms of reimbursement. Mm -hmm. She is willing to do this for us, to create this new class that is going to track with where we think the discipline's going. Yeah. Do well, you give her the funding to go to these two conferences? I, and the dean said, sounds good to me. Uh. I kind of wonder if your if your background in policing put you in a, in a good spot was at least kind of helping you acclimate yourself to an environment in which power dynamics play a role, as well as 
opening doors when you're doing research. Yeah, and the yeah, fact yeah. that you could say that I, I'm a police officer myself, yeah, here, yeah. so you, you don't need to be suspicious of me because yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm part of the tribe, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that always yeah. helps. It yeah. always helps. So there's some carryover, I guess, in, in that capacity. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Definitely, yeah. definitely carryover. Yeah. Uh, and again, the idea is that uh, you have tenure faculty, and carrots and carrots work, big sticks don't. Yeah, yeah. And and you know it's it's like being a good police officer. To me, the best police officer is one that uses their mouth, not their club. Oh, oh. Uh, you know, you yeah. get in, you defuse. Okay. You listen. Yeah. You explain what you're doing, and you find that people go, okay. Huh. All right. You know they do. All right. You know and you know I really don't want to arrest you on this. Yeah. But you know this behavior is in violation of the code and the law. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Can you call a friend to take you home? Yeah. You're not driving that car. <laughs> right. Can you call a friend? All right. Listen, I'll tell you what. If you don't have a friend that's available, I'll get you a taxi to yeah. take you home. All right. Yeah. Defused. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And so it's the same thing when you're an administrator. Absolutely. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. People get hot-headed. Yeah, they get hot-headed. First thing you want to do, calm them down. Yeah. Tell them you're listening to me. I hear All what right. you're saying. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. This is the restraints that I have. But given that, sure, I'm going to see what I can do. All right. Uh, let's switch tracks and talk about your teaching. Your oh, pro love your, the teaching. Your approach to teaching. Uh, one of the things that I appreciated about you uh, as a colleague was you could genuinely tell there was a zest for engaging not with just with the graduate students who are sort of the preferred class, yeah, yeah. generally speaking, in an R1 institution, but also engaging with the undergraduates as well. I love the right? undergrads. That's the bread and yeah, butter yeah, yeah, of what yeah, we yeah, do, yeah, yeah. but they're oftentimes sort of a, a secondary uh, thought in terms of I want to invest in, in that population as opposed to the yeah, folks that are going yeah, to help me yeah, advance yeah, my research yeah, agenda. Yeah. One of the things I do is I read the Washington Post and the New York Times because every concept that I'm going to talk about in intro class, yep. there's an example. Wednesday, before I came over here, had a morning class. Mm -hmm. I had a prosecutor come in to talk about prosecution. And of course, what was the first thing students asked? Something about Jussie Small. Oh, uh, declination. Yeah. What's that? And, and why did it happen in Chicago? Yeah. The idea is to make the course relevant. Okay. Relevant to them. Yeah. Now, do you need to get the concepts across? Oh. Of course you do. Yes. But you use examples to show how those concepts actually materialize mm -hmm. in real life. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you read the Post, you read the Times, there's an example for every concept yeah. you know, yeah. that's going on now, that's yeah. going on today. The Manafort trial. Yeah. You know, all these various things going on. Yeah. The Mueller report, investigations. Yeah. You know, hey, it's, it, it's I, all there. I suppose it's a matter of communicating in a genuine way that enthusiasm. Yeah, of course. Right. Of course. And my cl intro class, uh, they go to a jail. Oh. And they have a tour. Oh. And they talk to inmates. Uh, they go to the Eastern District of Federal Court where uh, Judge Leona Brinkema, she's great. She's the one that tried the Masawi case, oh. the Zechariah Masawi case. Oh. And she was a librarian, then she went to law school, became a magistrate, and then Bill Clinton made her an Article III judge. She loves students. Awesome. So what she does, she, has, she picks a case for us, mm -hmm. one that she thinks has really interesting implications or complications. Huh. She comes in informally, just talks to us about the federal system and why she thinks what we're going to see is exciting and interesting. Court then is open, prosecutors, defense attorney, defendant comes in, we hear the whole proceeding, mm. okay? Then she closes court. The defendant is taken away, but we have the prosecutors, we have the defense attorneys, and we ask questions. Huh. And wow. the students walk away going, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I have guest speakers coming in. Like I told you last Wednesday, it was a prosecutor, sure. I have police officers, prosecutors, I have a judge come in yeah. to talk to the class. I have a correctional officer come in to talk to the class. So, so to talk is, about what it's like to yeah. do their jobs. Yeah. So you're breaking, you're you're bringing the textbook out from just sort of the reading material yeah, yeah. out into the real world. That's the real world. That. These ideas yeah. actualized. And because that's what makes yeah. kids enthusiastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, first of all, they're thinking about careers. Uh, you know, and of course, all my kids want to go to law school. Sure. 
So, they're, you know, they're thinking about careers. And they start, you know, thinking about other aspects. Huh. That you know that if you're really going to be a good prosecutor, you have to understand what the police do. Huh. You have to understand what corrections does. You know, if you're going to be a correctional officer, you have to understand the process. How did this person get here? Why is this person here? Huh. And what do we need to do to keep that person from recidivating? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's all one thing. Okay. And it's great. Now, now, there's a different kind of mentality that a graduate student would have in terms of that kind yeah, yeah. of, a, kind of a, uh, the experience that they want out of that educational environment. Right. So, right. so how does that vary from, from your mentoring strategies? And you okay. chaired, what, 11 dissertations at this point? And chaired 11 and God knows how many. And you have all that these done. manuscripts with, with graduate students as yeah, well yeah. as junior, that, that's junior my policy. faculty. My and, policy uh, is when I, oh, let me go back. Yeah. AU is very selective in terms of who we bring in. Mm -hmm. First of all, we want to bring in people that are really sharp. Mm -hmm. But we have really pe sharp people that we don't offer. And that is because their area of interest Doesn't. does not fit with our program. Everyone who comes in has been vetted by our graduate committee to make sure that there's someone on the faculty. And we ask the faculty. Uh -huh. We say, look, are you interested? You know, so. Right off the bat, before we give them an offer, we have the faculty saying, yes, I'd be interested in taking this person because this person is doing death row and I'm interested in death row. Uh, and they're sharp people. So by the time they accept, their mentoring path has already been created. Now, we tell them when they come in, everybody changes their mind. So if you come in and you're very interested in, uh, well, let's say, things like Innocence Project, which we have John Gould. Mm -hmm. So you're going to work with John Gould. That's already been arranged. But you come in and you say, yeah, Innocence Project's good, but you know, I'm really interested in police. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Yeah. We'll put you with a police person. All right. So it's really flexible in that way. Yeah. Now in terms of mentoring, uh, my graduate student now uh, just came in. Uh, she is going to be presenting, she's presented one, she's going to be presenting a second paper here with us mm -hmm. at ASC. We have presented a paper at AC, excuse me, at ASC. We're two here at ACJS, and in the fall, another ASC. Uh, she came in, uh, little research experience. We put her right in, in the, in the field, in our body-worn camera evaluation. <laughs> so she helped develop surveys. She helped develop research protocol. She helped in conversations with the police department in terms of getting archival data. Yeah. She has been with us doing the literature review. Yeah. A lot of schools use archival data only. I'm, so I'm they just come about in. to mention this because there's a, there's a different kind of approach to this when you're actually conceptualizing the question and then going out and gathering the data to, to, yeah. uh, to speak to those, those particular theoretical points. Yeah, yeah. It's a complete, it's an, a total immersion. Well, as an example, to, the Belize yeah, study. Yeah. You know, if, if the graduate student didn't realize that we couldn't use proper sampling and that access and this and that were problematic, they don't understand the quality of the data. That's a great point. So here, this, this young woman uh, is getting the frontline experience. The woman before her, and now she's a third year, I brought her in on my retirement project, international retirement project. Development of the survey, contact with the foreign dignitaries, you know, interaction with the commissioners of police, yeah. you know, all the ins and outs of how we did this. Just the brokering of the data, just seeing how that happens. Yeah, yeah, right. That's, how do you that's get access? informative. How do you get access? Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, oh, uh, well, I know I shouldn't tell you. Yeah. But I, th that's invaluable. Those are intangibles. Yes. It's not simply just calling someone up and saying, I've got this NIH grant for $200,000, right, right, so yeah. could you give me the data? Hey. Exactly. Right. So, here's, here's the data. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't you know, work like that. You know, how is the data collected? Yeah. What errors could have been? What yeah. biases could have been introduced in the data? Yeah. You, you don't know that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. my feeling is you get them, and the way you mentor them, is you start out with a basic project and go through it. Okay. Uh, and I've published with every one of my PhD students except one. Oh wow. And that's because that's an impressive record. she left. No, that's yeah. mentoring. Yeah, that is. Yeah. You know, when yeah. I went to my first teaching job after the PhD, I had two publications. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So is it is Today, 
You don't get you don't get a telephone interview. Yeah. If you don't have publications. What was your own experience being mentored? Oh, uh, Florida great. State and. Well, and I told Washington you, Jim Set. Jim Short. Okay. You know, he's just a great guy. Yeah. We'd sit down. He says, "I like your project. You know, let's work on a little more. How much money do you need?" Okay. Well, I need airfare. I need publication. I need printing and da 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 da, da hotels, food. <laughs> and he, much, tell me how much you need. Yeah. And, and he'd go say, "So what are you finding? Yeah. What's your access like?" Yeah. You know, what, what, do you, what things are you finding? Uh, yeah. One of the things he loved was, remember, six months after, I surveyed them, and I surveyed their field training officer. Oh. Because in Tennessee, your first six months is with the field training officer. Uh -huh. So, I give this survey, and I start running the data. Jim Short said, what are you finding? And I said, it's like Lake, Lake Wobegon. He said, what do you mean? He said, <laughs> All the kids are above average. Yeah, you know that. Yes, okay. I do. Yeah. So I, I go back and talk to one of my confidants in the uh, Knoxville Police Department. And I said, what's going on here? Everybody's average. He says, Dick, come on, get a life. <laughs> he says, if I don't rate them average or above, I have to write anything below average. I have to write a dossier because what is that? That's leading towards their termination. He says, come on, Dick. Grow up, you know. <laughs> Everybody's above average. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, when you look at all the various domains of your your professional profile here, right, the, the mm -hmm. mentoring, the teaching, as well as the administration, and all the the projects and the papers that you put out, and the uh, professional reports, and the uh, the international speaking series of mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. sorts that you've engaged in. Uh, an active roster of uh, international appearances. Uh, what do you what do you look back on as uh, the thing that you think uh, is that gives you the most pride? Wow. What, what's what provides the most satisfaction oh, for you? Now they're different. Yeah. Okay. Satisfaction. Okay. Satisfaction is going into foreign nations, yeah. meeting people, spending time, learning cultures. Uh, that's the satisfaction. Yeah. When I worked for State Department, I put on any terrorism training. And I did it for 41 nations. And I was on, on boots on ground in 41 nations. Ah. Now, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and talking to people, seeing what their situations were, yeah. what their needs were. In other words, if we're going to put training together, what are their needs? <laughs> Th this that's is... satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, accomplishment? Did we do anything yeah. in those 41 countries? Maybe. What we did do, which the State Department would never admit, and I guess it shouldn't be on tape, but... <laughs> <laughs> that these training programs, mm -hmm. although they were for training, were also to create a relationship oh. with the top officers in the criminal justice system, and in the, not in the military, remember? Uh, yeah. Can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the criminal justice system, so a State Department employee could get on the phone and call the commissioner of police right. and talk directly. Okay. You remember the great time we had in Washington? Okay. Remember that Chinese restaurant we took you to? Sure. That was the first time you had Chinese food. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk. Yeah. Okay. 41 countries. Yeah. I, 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 anybody who stepped into his office, i got to mention, that's all the police caps. Oh, yeah. Those are from the countries that I've worked with over the, over the, over the years. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Uh, so, uh, so that, that's the greatest satisfaction. Right. I guess my greatest achievements have been mentoring and helping develop the next generation of researchers. Okay. You know, my time is just about over. Yeah. But these young kids that are coming out, yeah. they are going to shape criminal justice. Huh. And they're going to be the reformers and the researchers in the future. So if you want to say my accomplishment, yeah. That's what it is. Okay. It's helping the next generation take over from the old folks like myself. Yeah. But on the international tangent, uh, have you seen some development in, the, in a more, more openness to the idea of us communicating information to other countries, which we're really great at, but also receiving information back? Is there a growing dialectic on that front, or is it still... You know, I wish there were. In academia, there is. Has your work had some impact in terms of at least moving the needle? You've developed some of the administrative apparatus yeah, within yeah. both of the major organizations here yeah. that, that could prove to be a legacy of, of some kind. Hopefully so. Yeah. You know, we're becoming more and more global, yeah. and that's not going to stop. Yeah. 
the Pandora is out of the box mm. and we're not getting her back in. Yeah. So we need to have more tools and more understanding about how we do comparative international and transnational research. Mm. It's just imperative. If, we're, if, we're, if our criminal justice system and our system is going to survive, we have to adapt. Yeah. Because the world's changing and we can't, you know, close our doors and say, we're not going to do anything. Yeah. We've yeah. got to adapt. We've yeah. got to change. Yeah. And we have to understand what the change is, why we're doing it, and what's the benefit or the dangerousness. Okay. Uh, I, on that tangent, I, I'm wondering if there's any advice that you have to future generations that uh, might prove useful in terms of the development of their ideas and their own careers. Be enthusiastic. Okay. Dive into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Love what you do. <laughs> and and you'll you'll be productive. Yeah. You'll yeah. you'll make a difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, just enthusiasm. The difficulty is maintaining that, I suppose. Because of the, the drudgery of committee meetings and you gotta go oh, some yeah. people uh, some people dread teaching particular classes at the very least yeah. or well see that to, that's where you need right. a good administrator. Yeah. If you dread teaching that class, I don't want you in that sure. class. Because yeah. what it means is that student is not getting their money's worth. Yeah. So tell me where you want to be. Yeah. If I if you don't want to do it, I'll find an adjunct Perfect. who really wants to do it. Yeah. What do you want to do? Yeah. Now I'm in a private school. Mm -hmm. So I come to you, Brent. Brent, what do you want to do? Yeah. Well, I'd like to teach cybersecurity. Okay. We don't have a class in that. <laughs> Mention it in one of your classes and see if you can get 15 undergraduates or 10 graduate students. All right. And the class is yours. <laughs> Next semester, you're teaching it. Perfect. Now, what do I do? Oh. I say, okay, you were teaching something you hated. Yeah. You, you weren't putting yourself into it, so the students weren't getting their money's worth. Yeah. I find an adjunct. We're in Washington, D.C. Yeah. I find an adjunct who's just dying to get into a classroom. <laughs> so it's a win-win. Yeah. You get what you want, the students get what they want. In addition to having the, the baseline of enthusiasm, do you, are there, is there a skill set maybe that, that oh my you God, think yeah. one yeah. would need as well? Yeah. Or the skill set would... is really critical analytical thinking. Okay. I'm finding today that the students that we're getting in the PhD program uh, uh, do not know how to model. Uh, you know, they, uh, don't, they don't come from theory. Yeah. You know, they, they come from, oh, this is an interesting question. That's Let's survey the people and see what the answer is. Well, yeah. what, what questions are you going to ask them? What concepts are you, are, are you, are you trying to test? Yeah. Start from this, get from theory, and then go down to the empirical. I'm wondering how much that has to do with, you were trained in the sociology department. Yes, correct. Right? Yes, so correct. you were, you were going to be, a, you were going to have it or you weren't going to be in the sociology program. Exactly. And criminal justice, I, I wonder if you see it as being, just simply taking that as it needs it, uh, sort of ad hoc and not. I, I see a lot of that going on. Our program, we try to integrate the idea that good research is driven by theory. Okay? okay. Now, if you want to do theory development, you know, ground up, yeah. grounded theory, yeah. that's great too. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole different technique to that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to do the quantitative stuff, empirical stuff, mm -hmm. get that theory, figure out what concepts are in, the, in that theory, and that's what you measure. Right. That's what you test. You don't just go out and say, oh, I have a hypothesis. Right, but you, I guess you are you have to confront this because you're doing primary data, data gathering. Yes, correct. A lot yeah. of your work. Yeah. Right? You're jumping, you nearly jumped out of your office with excitement when I stopped in earlier this week. Yeah, yeah. The, some of the work you're doing in Fairfax. Yeah, right? yeah. And you're talking about having to go back into the field and maybe soliciting some more feedback from yes. those you, that you actually yeah. got survey data from. Yeah, right, it's a different right. kind of, yeah. kind of uh, uh, giving context. Correct. The survey data came out and I went, something's wrong with this. Yeah. You know, why does this group yeah. decrease in acceptance? That's exciting. You know, questions leading to more questions. Yes, exactly. But that's what research is. Perfect. So, yeah. And it's yeah. sometimes messy too, which is, which it, is it's sometimes, always messy. Which is sometimes it's difficult to wrap one's mind around yeah. that as an undergrad. Well, as an right. example, even as a graduate student. This is with this the research we're yeah. going to be presenting Saturday. Yeah. This was with citizens. Mm -hmm. We contacted citizens who had recent contact with Fairfax Police. Mm -hmm. We knew whether they were contacted by a body worn or by a non-body worn officer. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because they're separated. The way in which Fairfax sends their officers out in the street, a body worn is never with a non-body worn oh. because of the way All the, right. the uh, schedule goes. So 
we knew whether, you're going to have, whether they were contacted by a body worn or not. And we tried to see if there was difference. Absolutely no difference. Yeah. So, okay, what explains levels of satisfaction? Yeah. What drove the model was procedurally just treatment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it just didn't drive the model, it drove the model. Okay, what about collinearity? What about structural equation problems? So we spent almost a week taking those data and running them through every test we could to show that procedural justice was not the explanatory variable. We failed. Every test we did showed that, sorry, you know, we partitioned variants. We did, uh, huh. That's interesting. It is. Yeah. Which probably the police are going to love to know. Right. So speaking of the insights that may have been, right. Yeah. Speaking of ideas that may have maybe fallen flat or, or in some pushback, have, have, have some of your ideas been more difficult sells, or has there been pushback on some of the ideas that you've wow. you've, you've crafted over the course of your career, skepticism or oh yeah, or, or, of course yeah, and and you have to overcome that. Yeah, I mean every time I go into a police agency, except Fairfax. Yeah, uh, Fairfax. Could you maybe give us an example here in terms of a a contribution? Maybe on the international scene, some of your international Probably work. Probably the biggest or one was work. the retirement project. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, the reason I chose the nations I did, it was obviously self-selection, uh -huh. is because I, in the 41 countries I visited, yeah. I built up relationships with the top administration. Uh, it was easy there getting in, but then you had to convince the officers, the people you were going to observe, mm -hmm. the people that you were going to survey, uh -huh. that it was legitimate. Okay. And of course, the first thing the administration says, this is something we really need. <laughs> <laughs> so now your sales job yeah. is to get out there and convince them that there's a benefit in here for them. Oh. Now, in the Netherlands, it was an easy sell. Oh. I had two or three police commissioners I knew very well. Uh, and they said, Dick, they said, look, you know, we're going from 26 districts reorganizing to one national police. Just, just, we can't do it. I mean, we got so many problems going on now that we just can't help you. And one, one of them said, you know, Dick, why don't you c contact the police union? Huh. He said, you don't think they're going to participate? Their benefits might be cut. The retirement <laughs> might change. All these things. They're going to be redundant yeah. because now instead of 26 commissioners, yeah. you have one. Uh, he said, the, here's my friend in the union, contact him. Okay. So I contacted him. He said, great, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. The, I'm, re I'm reminded of one of your earlier papers about this issue of uh, the, the, pragmatic, the division between the pragmatics of things and the application of particular ideas and the theory and the ideas that actually sustain, yeah, yeah. That sustain yeah. those kinds of ideas. There's that huge gap. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know, here's the concept and here's right. X1. Right. This is what you're measuring. Oh, are you really? Yeah. But Are you? Yeah. And are you in, in international? Are you measuring? Oh, yes, we measure it in the United States. Right. Or, oh, yes, we measure it in the Netherlands. Yeah. But India? Yeah. Thailand? Get out. That's, that's one I think is, when I look at your career, I think that's one of the more identifying elements is your ability to 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 move across those seeming divides. Yeah, right? yeah. For you, it's not a division. No, it's it's, it's just, all it's all seamless. It's all sort because of because kind of the research is worthless. Yeah. If you don't have the pragmatic. Right. Right. And if you don't have the yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah I see it as pretty seamless relationships. Yeah. Um, so I almost hesitate to ask this just because you're brimming with enthusiasm, but if, if you were to have it to do all over again, damn right, would, would you do anything differently? Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. Uh, I'd definitely be a practitioner for a while. Okay. Because I think that really made up my mind mm -hmm. that rather than dealing with the tragedies of life every day, mm -hmm. look, you're a criminal investigator, you're dealing with tragedy. Oh, yeah. You know, you're dealing with death, no. You're dealing with sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with tragedy every day. Why not deal with something that has impact, 
but doesn't have the tragic undertones. Huh. Uh, maybe that's just selfish. Huh. But you know, I, I, I was, you know, suicides and oh. you know, dealing with relatives and you know, sexual abuse. You know, it's just yeah. I can leave my work at home. I mean that's at work. Yeah. Yeah. When I was an officer, I couldn't leave my work at home at, at work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was just something that drove me. Yeah. You know, the victims have to know. Right. You know, what happened? But at the Where's same, the perpetrator? At the same time, though, there's that sense of satisfaction if you sort of check that box on a call that you've diffused a potential assault or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. When I write a paper, or like, or you write a paper, Lord knows how it's going to be received yeah, or yeah. if it just sort of occupies, if it just gathers dust on the shelf or what have you. Right? Yeah. It's a different kind of, uh, kind of thing. Well, my contact, it's so personal. Yeah. Because all the things I do relate to people. Ah. That's how I get access. Uh, so it's still very personal. Yeah. I use my police skills, you know, the skills I developed mm -hmm. in interacting with people. All right. Transmitting the enthusiasm mm. to people, you know. Okay. It's showing them how they can benefit, maybe not right away, yeah. but how they can benefit or something can benefit by participating in the research project. All right. Uh, sort of a global question for you here. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is, I do it again. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim Short, I remember uh, having a conversation with him. Uh, he stated exactly oh, the same kind of kind of ethos. He says, "Great guy." If I, there's just so many interesting questions. Yeah. He says that he's just so excited to to tackle. I mean, uh, walk down the street of Baltimore. Yeah. And if you don't come up with five interesting questions, oh. you weren't looking. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, general thoughts on the state of the field. Uh, you've seen it from its infancy to, yeah. its, to its, a, its enormous development here. With both I, I think the big change <laughs> is moving from just general criminal justice, street crime. Huh. We're going to be moving more into sweet crime. You, you mentioned it was just it was just law enforcement at some early point. Oh, yeah, yeah, and now yeah. it's criminal justice. Now right? it's criminal justice, yeah. yeah. Now the courts are still hard to penetrate. Uh -huh. You know, for any type of research, uh, they're hard to penetrate. Yeah. Corrections, more than happy. Because they understand that if they can run a more efficient, more humane system, they're going to have less problems. Oh. Police are the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can teach how to de-escalate, how to treat procedurally just, oh. all these things, the officers are going to have an easier time. Oh. They're not going to be assaulted. You know, a whole bunch of things are going on. That's incredible. So yeah. that's where I think we should go. Yeah. But I think what's happening is the terrorism's not going away. Oh. Uh, so that's something that's growing, yeah. and understanding terrorism not so much as international yeah. terrorism from ISIS, yeah. but what we have here. Yeah. You know, understanding more about the lone shooter, yeah. understanding more about destruction. Yeah. These are things that criminal justice and criminology needs to start looking at. Okay. Criminology, as you know, has basically been kind of at the macro level. Mm. Now we're getting more interactive. Psychology has given up. Now, practice hasn't, huh. but mm. academic psychology huh. has kind of given us up, given crime up. Oh. How many, how many articles you that, see there? That's a fantastic point. Yeah, yeah that yeah. are. Yeah. So it's, it's us. Yeah. Now remember, we started out interdisciplinary. Sure. And we need to stay that way. Right. Because we need to become at these issues from not just one disciplinary with blinders on, okay. but from everywhere. All right. Everybody has something to contribute to us yeah. to understand why this takes place. And more importantly, how do you prevent it? Perfect. At the same time, abiding by the first ten amendments of the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's important. Yes. Right. How do you solve problems? Within the constraints. Within the constraints of our democracy. Yeah. That's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think we're going. Okay. Because, you know, there's more surveillance. Right. There's more electronic. There's more big data. Is there more transparency just in policing just in general, do you think? In the big departments, yeah. They're getting okay. more and more transparent because they realize they have to be. Okay. You know, that's the only way they're going to get cooperation from the citizens. All right. Uh, but, yeah, we're getting more surveillance, more big data. Well, right. More control. Let's not forget the fourth, fifth, All right. first, that second allow, amendment. Let's that, not forget those. Yeah, that allow some room for individual liberties. And exactly. Free from, exactly. All right. We don't want to become a 1984. 
Sure. Although 1984 was a few years back. It certainly was. I'm referring, of course, to George Orwell. Right. (laughs) Great point. Just Uh, to let younger people know, I'm referring to George Orwell. There we go. Uh, So, uh, it's been fantastic speaking with you. This has been great. Right. uh, Before we put a a bow on the proceedings here, is there anything that I may have neglected to, to ask about or... Uh, something that you wanted to highlight or speak, speak I, to I think it is, that we've left out. Yes. I think it is our job to mentor and help develop the next generation of criminologists and criminal justice people, mm-hmm. both in terms of those going into practice. This is something that most universities don't consider. Mm-hmm. Some of our master's students are going into practice. Yeah. That's why they're there to get a master's degree. Because as you know, more and more agencies yeah are either requiring or favoring a master's degree. So we're sending people out into the field. We're also creating the next body of researchers hmm. and teachers. Yeah. I think it is our obligation and our duty to make sure we do that job well. Perfect. Right? Because they'll, they'll be implementing. The they're going to be doing it. Yes. You know? Right. They're going to be carrying on. And that, in many ways that loops back to some of the guiding ethos of the LEAA to yeah, to yeah. make a more humane delivery of, yeah. of, of criminal justice yes, right. uh, modalities. And in the Wickersham Commission. Perfect. Back right. in the to 30s. To avoid the scandals yeah, of yeah, uh, yeah. the third degree and, and such. Yeah. Well, Dick, it's been fantastic hey. getting, a, getting an opportunity to chat with you it's here. It's been a real yeah, pleasure. I'm, I'm more enthusiastic. You're more enthusiastic by the, by the minute here. So. <laughs>